back on camera. Got the trailer all hooked up and headed on down to Central Vermont Motorcycles in Rutland where I bought the Boost Assault. Um, went into the trailer this summer, fired up, check on it and everything, all that good stuff. Found, you know, classic little oil puddle underneath. Uh, a bunch of people ran into this, the turbo oil pump housing cracks and leaks. Either way, warranty replacement. Um, took about a week and a half, two weeks, something like that. Get it in, diagnose, order the part, yada yada. Uh, got the call probably an hour ago. And yeah, on our way down, pick that thing up, get it back in the shop, and then uh, do a little overview on that for people that haven't seen the build thread on it. And we'll go from there. You know, a little afternoon something, just a little, little, you know, a little drink, a little snack, a little afternoon treat. And I go up to the register, which is now a robot in this store. You know, all these stores have robots. They're just, they're just the robot machine. You go up, you scan the thing, you pay yourself. But yet there's still the guy that stands there to watch the robot do its job. So now, like, it's just awkward in all awkwardness. What do I, what do, I do? Say, hey, how you doing? And he's going to go terrible because I'm watching this robot do my job. But it's not his job, but it is. If they're paying the guy to just stand there, why can't I just do the transaction with the guy? Why can't I just be like, hey, here's the money, scan the thing, boop, off we go. But no, he just stands there as a monitor. It's just weird. Just, just pay the guy to do the job. I don't want to have a robot. I'm not a robot guy. I'm gonna try to keep this overview pretty quick and just kind of point out what is on this sled and why I went with what I did. I could definitely do another video that's really in depth about the geometry changes and things like that and kind of deeper explanations on why I did what I did, if that's something people wanna see, but that's gonna be like a 20, 25 minute video of me just like pointing at stuff and talking and explaining things, which is probably pretty boring. So unless there's a demand or a request for something like that, I'm just gonna keep this quick and simple and try to just move through it. And Let's start at the you know cockpit area here. Kevin Krause, custom cap with my logo in there. Uh, this is a Skidoo one, which is why it clocks a little crooked. The thread pitch is basically the same between Dew and Polaris, but the clocking of them is different. This is just one I had left over and doesn't bother me enough to really worry about it. So toss that on there. I like to run these Cheetah crowbars, the CFR crowbar, whenever I can. Uh, they keep your stock 7 8 clamp, so you don't have to upgrade to a different riser or anything like that. I switch these back to the Axis style grip. That's been one of my favorite grips ever on any snowmobile. I have this little brake lever grippy. It's kind of nice, gives you a little bit extra grip on the finger there. Not a big deal, they're relatively cheap. Just a heat shrink, basically. So you just kind of slip it on, heat shrink it with a little mini torch, and on they go. This is a regular VR1 riser, the shorter one, not the stock assault one. It's powder coated black but it is a factory Polaris unit. 
Moving forward a little bit, I do have the punch lights. I have the Defend LED handguard things. But as a lot of you know, these things have that amber headlight, which is awesome, looks sick. But then you put white, white LEDs on it, kind of dumb. Like why, why didn't they offer amber? They didn't until now they have the RGB ones, which I don't know if we're even out yet, but they didn't offer amber. I wanted amber, so I went and I made them myself. They match the headlight, looks way better than just having white ones on there. Punch lights. I think they're really good. They work incredibly well. Super happy with those. Definitely overpriced. That's it. I think any, everyone, anyone and everyone will agree. They're a little too much. Going down through, I painted the vents black. Actually, those got powdered. Those are powder coated when I did the riser block. I painted the front ones here, but clearly <laughs> they don't hold up too well when you're following your buddy super close. But that's par for the course when you're riding hard. You got all these chips and scuffs and stuff from everything being thrown across your sled, but we all know that's the way it goes. So let's move on to clutching really quick. I got rid of the P22 right away. Uh, as soon as the sled came in, I already had this P85. It's all balanced and cut and everything from Indy Specialty, as you can see right here. Um, I love the theory of the P22. Really brand new stuff like that kind of freaks me out a little bit and I don't want to have any downtime when this was my one main sled for last year. I didn't have a second sled. I just didn't want to risk any downtime. I knew this was tried and true. It's still on stock tune. It's not crazy big power. So weights and going up high enough in weight isn't really a major issue yet. So I went with this from Indy Specialty. This thing has been incredible all season long. Man, do I get into the setup on what I'm running in here? Nah, not gonna do it. Um, balanced secondary from Dynatech, different helix, different spring, different spring, weights, usual clutching stuff. Swinging down to the front, we've got these awesome KYB Pro 40s. These are Kashima coated units from Ian over at Monster Performance. These do have the triple adjusters on them. So you have high and low compression, and then you also have essentially a low speed rebound. And then on the bottom here, you have your traditional rebound adjustment on the end of the shaft. These are 18 and a half inches long versus your stock matrix or axis shock is 17.33 unless you have an axis pro X. So an axis pro X also has an 18 and a half inch long shock, which is why, well, part of why I went with these, uh, long story short, without getting too deep into it, I went with the longer shock to test the theory of getting the front end up in the air and getting weight off of the front track shock and getting more, essentially more usable stroke back into that shock and letting it kind of do its job a little bit more rather than it just carrying the entire load of the sled. Um, that's a theory that I'm gonna run with with the Pro CC setup as well. I've tried it on a couple friend sleds, it works really well. So I'm gonna to continue to go that route. Um, like I said in the beginning of the video, that's kind of something I can really dig into down the road if people want that video or want that information. But until then, I'm not gonna ramble on it for 10, 15 minutes. We're just gonna keep on moving. So with these shocks being taller and longer, you obviously raise your center of gravity, changes the roll center a little bit, some other nerdy geometry things. So to combat that, I ended up taking the RMK spacers, cutting the inside width off a little bit, putting the spacer out there to move the ski center line over. I've also spaced the upper ball joint up, which changes some things with the camber curve. The other big one that I did after that was I ended up re-drilling the sway bar on both sides farther forward. That gives you a little bit more roll stiffness. Uh, you're reducing your lever arm from this point to here, which in turn increases the bar rate, makes it stiffer, resists roll more. I found that one link forward in that more aggressive position and one in the standard position is kind of the best balance. I found that running one link on the stiff position and the other one in the stock position is the best balance for me. It gives me increased roll stiffness that I was looking for, but it also maintains some compliance when you hit bumps with one ski and not the other one. So if you're riding like Tug Hill where you have a lot of opposed bumps where they're not perfectly straight and they're kind of like one's here and the other one's staggered a little bit, I would probably leave it in the soft setting on both. That way you get that compliance and it doesn't end up pitching the sled side to side as you encounter the bumps. Um, there's also the Axis XCR sway bar. It's a smaller diameter, which is softer yet. So if you're someone who's really pounding Tug Hill with all those opposing bumps, that might be a move for you to upgrade to or swap out to rather. But if you do that, you will need the bushings as well because the bushing obviously is what holds the bar and the diameter is different. Moving to the back, both shocks have been revalved. I did have an issue the first time they got rebuilt where there was some metal debris and things like that inside of them that tore up some seals and caused some issues. That's all been sorted. The things are incredible now. The valving is really good. Happy with those. 
went to a dual rate front track shock setup. It's the high gear springs. I did change the crossover stack a little bit and I played with some things there to get that performing how I want. You guys can see how loose that limiter is right now. So that front track shock has as much stroke as it can up and down. I am running both light duty torsion springs in this at the moment. Uh, I did most of the season with one standard and one light duty, but I found it was a little bit harsh still. I might go back depending on how it rides and stuff. I put on a little bit of weight, eight, 10 pounds. So I don't know if that's gonna be enough to warrant me having to jump back to one standard and one light duty, but I'm gonna find out the first couple rides and we're gonna go from there with that. Should note, these are skidoo adjusters, the five way adjusters instead of just the factory three. The center hole is a little bit smaller, so you gotta drill that out. And then the skidoo ones don't have this backer. So I had to cut this out of some plastic panel bonded them and screwed them and made sure that they're not coming off. That just keeps your spring centered from walking over and rubbing on the torque arm. I went with Avid eight inch wheels and a TKI axle. I realized that I wasn't gonna, ah, this is just fucking awkward as all hell. I need a tripod. Um, I realized I wasn't gonna run studs in the one three Cobra. So I ended up going with the one five Storm and then I put the ST28R eye grips in it. It's the exact same setup that I did in the 650 over there. Nope. And then uh, that thing, well, not in that thing, but that thing is, is here. So anyway, I did those. Uh, first time doing this track with the eye grips. I had a friend that ran the Ice Storm, the pre-studded. I'm falling over because I'm kneeling down, don't worry about it. And that track was really good and I was impressed with it, but I wanted a little bit more grip on the icy stuff. So I wanted these ST28. I'm super happy with those. Eye grip has just been awesome. I don't think any of these have pulled out. I don't think any of them are starting to. I mean, they're just rock solid. So a bunch of people probably heard it coming into the shop and were like, oh, I wonder what muffler's on this thing. Uh, it's that one, believe it or not. Yep. Not really gonna get into that one for you, but um, can use your imagination on this portion of it. We'll just, we'll go with that. Just think of, think of what's going on in here. You guys can check out the build thread on Hardcore Sledder. There's uh, pictures and videos and stuff in there. I'll link that in the description for you. But uh, yeah, nice, nice stock one for you. Got it. You can't see them from here. I could flip the camera and zoom in on them, but that doesn't really do any good because a spark plug is a spark plug. You can Google a spark plug. I'm running BR9 EYAs in this. A little bit better idle stability, not as prone to fouling. I am running the stock skis, believe it or not, with just a regular six inch round bar. Uh, with the longer shocks and the added ski pressure from picking weight up off the front track shock, I found that the stock ski works really well on our Vermont hard pack. Some conditions where it gets really loose, you know, if it's, you know, really cold snow that doesn't have a lot of moisture in it or it's been freshly groomed or whatever, there is a little bit of excessive push, but I'm more than willing to deal with that for the thing to steer light and feel way lighter and be more nimble. I did run slide dog attacks on here with multiple different carbides and I just found, like always, I'm not a big fan of the square keel, square bar setup. I can dig into that a little bit. I'll throw a couple clips in here, me explaining that, but to keep it short and sweet, I just like how easy and light these skis feel. I can work around the carbide, I can factor in my push, and I can get these things to work while not tiring out my arms and shoulders all day. I think that's pretty much gonna cover it for the overview of the Boost Assault. It's probably a little bit boring for everyone to just kind of watch me talk about this with a little bit of B-roll in there, but I wanted to get an overview of this machine and what I did to it last year that way, when I do make the future videos on it and the small changes and stuff I'm gonna do this season, there's at least a little bit of a background on what this sled was, why I did what I did, and why I'm going the direction I continue to go with it. Future plans, I would like to do a tune at some point. Um, on the fence about who I'm gonna go with there and if I wanna really spend that money on this because I don't know if I need it, to be honest. I, it runs great as it is, is plenty fast. It just, it, it works great for me and like the bigger trips to Maine and the faster trails. I'm just super happy with it. I don't know if I need to go and change that. I might all like on the same topic, I might go back to the P22 and try that out for a little bit. We'll see, we'll see what the season holds, how the 650 build goes. 
This thing I know is dialed and set up great as it is. I can hop on, go ride it anywhere I want, but I do need to do some small maintenance things. I say small, but I gotta do the reed pedals. Um, I don't know if any of these are chipped yet. I haven't noticed a drastic loss in performance or anything like that, but I know it's an update. I would like to get that done. I'd like to do the reed cage assembly, the new billet setups that people are making. Gotta throw one of those in it. I think that's about it. Yeah, I think that about covers it. If there's any questions, put them in the comments or go on Instagram, send me a DM, whatever you wanna do. I'm more than happy to answer any questions and share information and whatever I've been doing on this thing. Um, yeah, if there's anything else you guys think I should do, put that down there as well. I'm more than happy to try anything. If you've got a setup you think is gonna be better or think might work you know, better for me, by all means, let me know, I'll try it out.